Uh, this is Edison, and uh, our <coughs> presentation is actually on uh, building a high throughput uh, and secure blockchain pl platform. This is something that we have been working for the past uh, few <coughs> years. Yep. And so, something about me. So I'm Chin Hao, so I'm actually a former computer science student in NUS and also co-founder NUS Grey Hats, which is uh, something like NUS Hacker, but they look at the cybersecurity aspect. And after I left NUS shortly, actually, uh, together with a few others, we started uh, Zilliqa, a new high uh, throughput blockchain platform at NUS Hangar, so it's at iCube there. So from there, we uh, <coughs> We actually took off and have a really a uh, production ready uh, blockchain network. And, and uh, yeah. yeah, so my name is Edison. Uh, that, 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 that slide wasn't a typo. My Chinese name is really Jinghao. So, so, <laughs> so, uh, so we have this joke in uh, Zodeka is that there's like Jinghao number one, and I came later because I'm Jinghao number two. So you can call me as that as well. So, um, I, uh, I, unlike Jinghao, I'm not from the US. I did my uh, master's in CMU, Carnegie Mellon, then I came, uh, came back to Singapore. So. Uh, currently, I'm in a company called Achilles, which is um, Zodiac's application name. So, um, uh, so yeah, so uh, I'm also doing software engineering there. So, um, Zodiac, we have uh, these two companies right now, Zodiac and Achilles. So, Zodiac is what Jinhao has been mentioned, deep tech research uh, in blockchain security, uh, smart contracts, and so many more into the more uh, systems level and compilers level like uh, things. Then uh, Achilles is like the, the it's, a, it's a new venture arm, which is an application arm of Zelika. We build business application on top of Zelika. So currently we are focusing on the one of few things here. Yeah, so yeah, so maybe I just borrow this. Yeah, so uh, we are uh, so we are fo we are focusing on a few things here, including business application in the digital media space, trying to see how do we actually balance like brands, uh, consumers, and also platform. Uh, and so we are primarily an application uh, company driven around digital media. So um, so today we are just going to go through um, the very quickly on the few agendas that we are creating in our company. Uh, because Zodeca is actually well known for actually two things. One is a high throughput blockchain, and another one is our own smart contract language. Because we created our own smart contract language, which uh, we'll be going through with you later. So uh, Jinhao will be covering the, the first two points uh, very briefly. What is blockchain? Uh, short overview on consensus algorithms. Then the um, we we will be introducing one of the very core parts of uh, view change protocol, which is actually what makes Zodeca. Uh, the way that it is. It's a very core essential protocol enhancements that uh, protocol, protocol that we have. Then I will be introducing you to the uh, smart contract language that we have. Um, and also also uh, letting you guys know about like DApp development, how do you even get started. So I'll pass on the mic to Jin Hao who will be talking about the blockchain stuff. Okay. So uh before I actually really go deep dive into uh Zilliqa uh corporal combat I would just like to uh, start off with like what is really like a blockchain and really like a blockchain 101 to you know try and bootstrap a, a blockchain from scratch and you know and at a high level and try to you know make a toy blockchain first yeah so when you actually google what is exactly a blockchain you will notice a lot of people saying that it's just like a series of blocks linked together by a chain and you will see like a lot of words, things like consensus, things like decentralization, things like immutability. And this is really what you got. So um, of course, if you dive deeper, then you will realize there are more interesting stuff. So for now, it looks pretty boring. So let's make things a bit more interesting. So we will try to create a toy blockchain that mimics something like a Bitcoin for now. And for, for a start, uh, let's try and populate some useful content. A blockchain is just like a data structure. So you can actually populate anything if you want. If you want to populate like addresses, you want to, I mean like streets of Singapore, you want to populate things like transactions and so on. So in the context of like cryptocurrency <coughs> per se, like Bitcoin, they, each block actually contains a list of transactions and the transaction records what has happened. For example, in this case, I have uh, three blocks. And in each block, I say give uh, Jinhao time, which is myself, 50 BTC, uh, 50 Bitcoin, and I have three times. So I have, in the blockchain, I have uh, 150 Bitcoins. The toy Bitcoin, of course, not the real one, because the real one costs $10,000 right now. But anyway, so uh, after that, um, we want to have the first property, which is decentralization. How do we actually decentralize it? Because right now, if, you, if I put it in my, uh, let's say, my server at 
digital ocean and say this is my blockchain is not decentralized so we want to actually push it out into the internet let thousands of nodes uh, actually handle it and it become decentralized so now we have decentralizations but the problem is that uh, the, the world is actually very very hostile someone can just come in and say uh, modify a few block, uh, records and say that uh, give uh, Chin Hao Lim which is Edison instead of me like 50 BTC and you know just go and modify a few blocks and push it out to the internet and this is something not ideal we want the blockchain to be immutable that means you can't actually modify past record at least easily and let's try and do something because as computer science students I mean at least there are a few probably here we, we, we want to do things uh, proper and make sure that our system is robust so let's do more uh, validation let's say uh, let's link our blockchain in a more secure way let's don't just say uh, block one, block zero for by block one for by block two Let, let's link it via a cryptographic hash that means the first block will follow by the second block and it is linked the second block will have a cross reference back to the first block via a, sh a hash, a checksum like a SHA-256 of the previous block. So in this case, you can see that this block is, uh, this block is tied to this block and this block is tied to uh, this bl uh, block. So you can see that now uh, we are more secure because anyone right now um, who want to modify a record, it might be harder. Let's try, see whether can we do this uh, modification of the record. So let's say uh, Edison come and modify the record again, uh, 50 uh, BTC. Then now we at the next block. Then when people try to start verify the block, they will realize that the, actually the hash is mismatched. So from here on, right, they will know that this block, this is has been actually temporary, and we shouldn't trust this. So in this case, right, we actually achieve the property of uh, immutability of blockchains. But the problem is that even if you have valid blocks, right. Um, you know, thousands of uh, nodes are actually running the blockchain. How do you ensure that people are trusting the uh, right block? Because I can just take a, a real blockchain, chop it into half, and just feed it to the whole and say, nah, this is the this is the new blockchain. You shouldn't trust the longer one. You should trust the shorter one. And this will create a lot of uh, issues because you are dealing with, uh, in this case, cryptocurrency like BTC. So if you chop it into half, you can actually just reverse your transaction that you just actually just submitted. So this is not ideal. So we are actually lacking of something what we call a consensus protocol. How do we actually achieve consensus on what is the global state of blockchain? Because we want every single node in the world, like a few thousand or even like tens of thousands to have the same blockchain. We do want them to have a shorter blockchain. We do want them to have a blockchain that has been tampered with. So now we are at a cons consensus protocol. So um, in in the blockchain world, they actually has really really a lot of consensus protocol. But I will just briefly touch base on uh, two consensus protocol, which is uh, quite well known nowadays. Which is uh, the first one is the Nakamoto consensus, which is uh, Bitcoin is uh, what Bitcoin Ethereum is using, and second is something what I, uh, we call Byzantine fault tolerance. Uh, protocol which uh, a lot of permission blockchain or like a uh, permissionless blockchain like Zilliqa is also using for the second one. So you can foresee that there is some dif differences. For example, in Nakamoto consensus, right, uh, you will realize that every it's like the Ready Player One uh, movie. Everyone is trying to uh, look for a solution to a piece of puzzle, and the the person who found the solution will actually win the whole reward. But whereas for like a Byzantine fault tolerance, it's not so exciting like finding a solution per se, but it's more like you have a parliament and you have someone who proposes a bill and you are trying to ensure that the whole parliament can agree on the bill through a majority. So this, uh, these are the two uh, differences in the consensus uh, protocol at a very high level. So uh, back to our toy blockchain, just now where I left off is that uh, we have like a few chains and now we need to decide actually not uh, we, is the whole network need to decide which blockchain we need to accept because we do want to accept a chain that is like shorter we do want to accept a chain that is like tempered with so according to Nakamoto consensus uh, we should uh, actually follow the longest chain rule so whoever want to start mining onto the new chain they should pick the longest one but of course you need to pick a valid one so in this case the number one which is having three blocks is uh, shorter than number three so we won't pick that one 
Number two is actually uh, invalid blocks because someone has tampered with, so we won't pick that. So we will actually pick the chain three, we, although it's shorter than number two, but we will still go with that. So this is uh, this is the first part whereby uh, the longest chain rule. And of course, uh, as part of Nakamoto uh, consensus, to, to uh, agree on a new set of transactions, someone has to like mine the block. So someone has to put in all the, all the transactions into a block and try to mine that block. So this is like, uh, they are always competing. So this is, uh, the winners will just append a new block to the existing chain. So this is Nakamoto consensus. So now our, actually, we have just bootstrapped a uh, blockchain per se. Now we got decentralization, we got immutability, we even have a consensus protocol. So this is like um, a very quick overview of how we actually can bootstrap this uh, blockchain at a conceptual level. So now we have a blockchain, are we done yet? So that, that is actually, the alternate title is actually motivation for Zilliqa because we got Bitcoin already, we got Ethereum already. Are we actually done yet? So today, uh, Bitcoin can process about seven transactions uh, per second. So if you calculate uh, per minute, it will be in the tens, uh, thousands of transactions, which is quite a lot, I think. But is it really a lot? Because at, at, uh, at peak hours, if there is a congestion, you will end up with a situation like this. And this is something that is not ideal because seven transactions per second is way, way below like PayPal, way below like Alipay, pay, way below uh, Visa. Visa is like 2,000 2, plus, trans and, no, Visa is five or 6,000. Alipay is like easily in the tens of thousands transaction per se, second. So Bitcoin may, will have this issue. And in the past, we have seen a lot of uh, this kind of issue happening on Ethereum. And there are some solutions actually. So one solution is we double the block size, let more transaction come in. Not enough, we just double again. But uh, do you dare to, you know, see this kind of bus like that is like hundred storage uh, level? It's not really like a full solution. We need like a more redesign the whole system again and try to do it better. Not just like using a naive way just to double and double and double because. By doubling, you only double the throughput from 7, 7 to 14, 14 to 28. But you want, it's still way below like uh, Visa, Alipay, and so on. So what we actually do in Zilliqa is that we, we, are, we were like, look, we have this entire big network. Why not we chop the network into multiple pieces? That's what we call shard. And each shard can process a set of transactions. That means we also shard the whole transaction. Let's say we got like uh, 10,000 transactions, we chop it into four pieces, and each shard will actually process for uh, one, one of the sh uh, subset of the transactions. So, and after that, we just aggregate to them together and form a new blockchain. So this simple solution help us actually scale up the throughput by uh, actually a lot, a lot of times. So these are some of our experimental results we have in uh, when we are running our testnet like two years ago. So when we are having a node of let's say uh, 1,000 eggs, we actually achieve a, a throughput of around 1,000, 1,400 TPS. But the, the nicer part of this uh, system is that because we are actually doing a divide and conquer, right? So as the number of node, uh, network uh, nodes grow, right? You'll notice that the throughput will actually increase and increase linearly. Not, unlike like uh, Bitcoin, right? You, it's forever at seven. Now we will see a, tr a rising trend that is li linear. So um, what about the consensus protocol that we are using? So in our case, we are not actually using the, uh, the proof of work and the Nakamoto consensus because what happened is that those are like very competitive and you need to forever fighting to, to um, mine a new block. But this is not ideal because what we want is we want the whole network to actually cooperate with each other and agree on a set of transactions to be processed. Then we move on to the ne next one. So, some interesting fact about this uh, PBFT is uh, practical Byzantine for Torrent is that it's actually proposed by uh, McGill and uh, Barbara in actually MIT lab. So they proposed it in, I think, 1999. And it's uh, one of the like, breakthrough in the whole consensus uh, research uh, area. And 
some fun fact is that Barbara actually uh, after that went on to wo- win the Turing Award for his for her contribution in object oriented and also P- PB active and also a lot of other stuff. So she also is a Prof. Ben Leon a PhD advisor. So this is just some fun fact. Yeah. And okay, so how does uh, this um, P- PBFD work? So the idea is that you, you can think of it as a parliament. You, someone proposes a bill and the rest of the parliament will try and debate and try to agree on the outcome. So if someone actually, uh, if the parliament actually reach a majority, then we will, uh, there will be a consensus reach and you will mine a new block. So if there's uh, no consensus reach, right, then you, we will have a network stop, unfortunately, because no one can agree on anything. Then the parliament will, you know, go haywire. And, but in this parliament, it's very special because now it, this is a decentralized network. We need to ensure uh, the nodes are actually what we call Byzantine. So they can actually drop off. They can actually kill each other. They can kill themselves. They can actually like spoof a message to lie to others. So we need to take care of all these kind of situation. At the same time, still reach a consensus. So um, when we are running our mainnet, because our mainnet has been running for half a year, we actually went through a few rounds of stores. And some of the reasons we found that why the network stores are actually, the leader actually drop out of the network. Sometimes the leader are you know, just lagging behind and they cannot keep up with the network. So they actually drop out. Or sometimes the leader is actually overwhelmed. So suddenly there's a lot of uh, um, transaction going on and sometimes due to some uh, poor autom- optimization, they actually overwhelm and they can't perform the leader of the role of a leader and so on. So yeah. So what is the solution for this kind of consensus protocol is uh, we can actually do something like a coup d'etat. That means we, we just say, look, this leader, we don't want you anymore. We want to change to a new leader. And that's what we call a view change. That means the view of a leader, let's say, which is me, has been changed to Edison. So this is, um, so everything is actually very good. So if the leader is ab- able to do his own work right, then you do need to do a view change because the consensus protocol is running and there's no issue. But what if the leader is not performing the role due to various reasons, let's say uh, the health is not good, like it get killed and so on. So we need to do a view change. So the rest of the network need to come into an agreement to actually elect a new leader. And if you think about it, this is something not very trivial because you are running a decentralized network. You are running nodes all over the world, around all, all the continents, all the countries. How do you actually elect a new leader? So we need to have a deterministic way, uh, way to actually elect a leader. In Zilliqa, what we do is we actually make use of the previous block. We hash it together with a view change counter. That means the number of times the view change has occurred to get an index to the new leader. In this way, right, all the, once a leader fails, all the other nodes will know that uh, who is the next leader that we should pick. Yeah, and of course, um, because there's a consensus failure, you should be expecting something is wrong with the network. So after a view change, right, we actually run the network for one round at a degraded mode. That means we need to uh, reduce some, uh, some um, limits. Let's say uh, we, we reduce the number of transaction process to a lower number so that the new leader won't get overwhelmed. If not, right, the new leader will get overwhelmed and the cycle repeats. So you have a view change after a view change and so on. So this is not healthy. So we need to run in a temporary, in a degraded mode. Then after that, we'll move on with life. So next I will hand on to Edison to uh, talk more about building a decentralized uh, smart uh, application. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, um, um, there are, so when we when it comes to building applications on the blockchain, uh, there are a few differences from what we have conventionally, being like a traditional server when you talk to a deba- database. So uh, in most of what today is that you have a very standard client application that will talk to a server. Server gets the things from the database and it's all set. You know exactly who is going to access the database. If you don't make anything stupid like having the default password for the database, your database is pretty much all yours. So you can very much know that this is something that can only be done by you. 
But when the, the problem is that when you're interacting with what we call like a decentralized blockchain, so just think of blockchain as a data, like a decentralized database. And in this database, right, it's worldwide, so which means anyone can actually use it. There's uh, not just you, uh, there's also like ton, uh, like millions of people who are just like you trying to assess the blockchain, uh, trying to make changes to the data state. So you have like a mixture of wallets and uh, contracts, smart contracts on the blockchain. I'm going to explain what a smart contract in a minute. So uh, because of this uh, intersection, uh, I mean, because of this complex ecosystem of wallets and contracts, it can make uh, development a lot uh, more challenging than before. So, um, uh, so one way to think about blockchain is that uh, we, th we think of it as an infinite state machine. Because when we, uh, I mean, in, 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 uh, in school, we have learned, learned that state machine is basically something that change state over time. So in, uh, in computer, computer science, there's always a, this uh, difference in theory. There is a discrete state machine, which means that you change state and you know, you know that there's a, there's a fixed number of states that are possible. So this makes like, reasoning things a lot easier. But for our blockchain itself, it's going to grow indefinitely. I mean, uh, Zedeka is like six months in. We hope that it can grow forever and indefinitely. And uh, so this is, a in, this is an infinite state machine that we do not know how many states it has. And, uh, and because of that, it makes it very hard for us to reason about safety and security on the blockchain. So, um, and also just, uh, so just some, some other characteristic of blockchain is that uh, we have what we call like a global execution, which means that uh, the complex ecosystem of accounts, which is being like wallets that you have, and also smart contracts can be complex. So, uh, so just one example. So let's say that I am uh, account X. I can send a message to contract C, and uh, contract C can at the same time fire like multiple messages to multiple places, like contract E, Y, and D, and etc. And um, so, and, and these contracts, they can go downstream as well. They can talk to other things. They can talk to an account or a contract. You will never know, and you will, it's very hard for you to specify as well. And, um, and a contract E, in some cases, it can even re-enter contract C. So, so it is that you can always like, go into this like, loop over here. So because of this characteristic of blockchain, where you can send things to another contract, contract can talk to other contracts, or can talk to other accounts, it can make the whole uh, hops a lot, a lot more complicated. Um, I, I know I'm jumping a little bit of places, but I uh, just want to show you guys that how this actually runs in the blockchain is that uh, if you imagine your client application being a web application or a mobile application, you have it as what we call a client. And uh, the way to interact with a blockchain is really to talk to a, like a remote protocol, like a, a re remote procedure call, like RPC, where, where you can execute certain things. So, um, so this is your only interface, so which, makes, makes, which makes it hard that uh, you have to actually do a few security checks over here if you are trying to build an application. Number one, uh, your, your client application must be designed for something that handles a blockchain architecture. You need, to, you need to know that latency is a thing on a blockchain and it's not like instantaneous re response directly to you. On a smart contract wise, you need to consider the security threats with like multiple uh, account execution model that I showed you just now because your, your messages could be sent to other contracts, contracts can send to other contracts, and it can go on indefinitely. And uh, except for a certain case, like in Zodica, we have a, we have a maximum call depth. But anyway, that the, the, I mean that the key thing is that it can always go into places that you will not, you will not expect. So, um, so yeah, so I know I've been talking a lot about smart contracts, but what, what it really is. So um, smart contracts, if you think of it simply, is that um, it, they are just pieces of computer code that runs not on your machine, but on the blockchain. So which means that it is, uh, it is, uh, it is a piece of code that miners all over the world will have to run your, your code and you can get that predictable output. So uh, just to give you one example, so if you have like say a crowdfunding con contract where you can actually raise funds from people, you can raise like Bitcoin and, and etc. from people, and uh, this smart contract will automatically execute certain conditions, like making sure that uh, checking whether your amount has, has been reached or not before calling it a success and uh, stopping any future, future like contribution. So, um, and also smart contracts are basically um, stateful mutable objects that are replicated via a consensus protocol. So this is what uh, Jinhao has mentioned just now. And uh, uh, in, the, in the blockchain space, we typically call this a store of value. So in the early 2000s, you have the internet, which is an exchange of information. 
but in the blockchain and decentralized architecture, we are thinking that we might be entering the next phase, which is that internet is just not just for information, but it's for value. And uh, on the blockchain, it is not like a big data you just store like um, multiple cat photos there, and 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 um, as uh, and you expect it to actually learn from those images. But you really want it to store value, and you want it to create meaningful applications for your business. And um, it can uh, there's a lot of entry points to it. It can be uh, like because you have a you have a smart contract which can be caught by other smart contract. So this is what we mean by it can be invoked reactively by other smart contracts. But it can also be be invoked by a client transaction. So let's say I have a mobile app, like a user who wants to say contribute to my crowdfunding contract. So this is where it can actually create a client transaction into your smart contract. So these are the few usages of a uh, of a uh, blockchain, crowdfunding, uh, ICO, which is the initial coin offering. It's a it's a new way of raising capital in startups today. That's how Zodiac raised capital, and uh, multi-party accounting, uh, voting, arbitration. There are people who think about creating a decentralized governance. Uh, it, is, it is a very interesting idea, and also there's also uh, games and puzzles with like where you can automatically calculate who actually gets what reward when certain conditions are met. So, um, so these are what we call smart contracts, and um, and so this is an example of a smart contract. I'm aware that this is extremely small. So, uh, on the contract side, on this is a Ethereum smart contract. Firstly, so it has a map. So a map is like a is like a hash map, a key value store, and also it has some like uh, variables here. It has some functions, and uh, the way that you look into this uh, contract code, which is written on on Solidity, which is an Ethereum smart contract, you realize you you will real, realize that it is exactly like um, JavaScript. It is it is a uh, very similar to JavaScript. Yep. So. Um, but generally, um, contracts on the blockchain has a bit of few traits. One is that it must, um, it, it is very complex because it needs to do a few things. It needs to first of all s store data, because uh, whenever you have things and because we call it a stateful thing, a uh, stateful contract, it must store data within a smart contract, and also it must it must have functions. It must have the mathematical uh, ability to actually calculate your algorithms to to make uh, certain logics work. It must be able to communicate with a few people or a few contracts. So this is the the traits about like a uh, smart contract on the blockchain. And if you look into this like very long hexadecimal string right here, so this is what we call an address. So uh, on Zelika, it, it is a twenty bytes um, address that you can actually um, that is like your your unique location. If you if people send money to this address that only you have the private key to, then this is your money. So it is your private place on the blockchain. Um, so some things that we are thinking of with uh, with regards to smart contract is that uh, is there a need for like a high level language for smart contract? Inst instinctively, people say that yes, we might have we must have it because it's very hard for us to. It's easy, I mean, it's easier for application developers to actually interact with smart contract codes like JavaScript. Uh, but you have a, so in Ethereum, you first of all it looks like a JavaScript, uh, which is created for the internet and not really created for a blockchain. Uh, when you call a function, let's say you 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 can actually send funds to the to the contract. You can send your ether or like Zelika tokens to uh, like a smart contract in general. Uh, on Ethereum Solidity, you also have like general recursion. You have uh, different kind of implicit conventions, which is a uh, a characteristic inherited from JavaScript. And also, you don't have really a formal semantics for you to reason about safety properties of a smart contract. So. Um, and because of all these properties, uh, I mean, Ethereum is the first mover for sure. I mean, they popularized the term called smart contract before it was cool. So, uh, but being the first mover has this disadvantage, which is that there are various bugs that you don't really see. So, over the, over the past few years, we have seen multiple bugs like this, which led to the loss of money, uh, and uh, and and many attackers are trying to attack smart contracts on the on the blockchain because it is the perfect hiding spot for attack. I mean, why attack a bank when you have a blockchain that you can attack? So right in front of you. So this is exactly what happens with Ethereum. So in Zelika, what we are trying to create here is to create a safer smart contract language. So this language is actually created by, uh, uh, by uh, designed by Professor Iya Sagi. I'm not sure if any one of you are his student. So we created this language at Zelika called Scylla. 
and uh, it aims to make smart contracts safer. So Scylla has a few goals that, uh, that we are thinking of is that, uh, first of all, smart contracts being the custodian of funds. You can, think of it, you, can, you can think of them as that because they store money, so they must be very safe. And, um, and also Scylla contracts are designed for infinite state transition systems. So unlike JavaScript, which is like created for internet, we actually wrote the Scylla from scratch because we know the characteristic of blockchain and we want to make it as secure as possible. So the inter um, and similarly from uh, the other other blockchain itself is that smart contracts must be able to interact with other smart contracts to send and receive funds. Uh, messages will trigger like transitions on the blockchain, which is basically like uh, functions on contracts. A contract can send messages to other contracts, so including that they can send uh, they can call another function in another contract, or they can send money to another contract or another user. Um, the most computations on Scylla is actually done through uh, pure expressions. So this actually helps us to actually get some formal semantics to reason about safety, safety property of blockchain. And also the contract data actually consists of multiple like immutable parameters, mutable fields, which is what we normally call data, and also balance. So this is actually how a smart contract would look, look like if you, if you were to sort of like um, look into its body is that it will first of all has a library pure functions. So pure functions are functions that only does mathematical computations, but they don't actually create any state changes. So uh, this is a procedure that we have added just recently. Um, so when we are creating a new blockchain, we realize that there's a need for a uh, contract to basically share code with each other. Uh, like within the contract, they want to share snippets of code within uh, that assess the, the contract data. So we created procedures for that. There's also immutable parameters, which are parameters that once you deploy to a blockchain, you can't change it anymore, as the name suggests. So there's also mutable parameters, which is the data of the, of the blockchain. You can, uh, for example, you can change the, the values and etc. And you have transitions, which are basically functions. So they can uh, execute certain conditions when you call it to be. So this is the, uh, the, the anatomy of the Scylla smart contracts. And uh, if you want to look into the code itself, this is the Scylla code. Scylla code resembles a lot like OCaml, which is a which is a functional language. So if you look into the semantics of it, is that uh, I'll walk you through the code slowly one by one. Is that you have a few you 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 have a few characteristics here. First of all, you have the structure of an incoming message, the parameters that you're getting at. So um, we actually have a so this is an uh, illustration, but you have a byte string twenty type to actually say that this is uh, an, an address from the blockchain. So you will have a, so because uh, the, we want to be able to reason about the properties of blockchain, so there is a way to actually for you to, to read from a contract state. So uh, variables cannot assess and change the state directly. You need to actually read it first, update, then you need to push it to the state. So, and because we have a few pure functions, which are, so pure functions are things that uh, that, that do computations, but they don't change the state at all. So, so they only give you a result. So these are pure functions that we create. So this is how we actually interact with uh, like a mutable view. So let's say if you want to try to assess the data uh, from the blockchain, you have this uh, arrow syntax for you to actually reference that variable. And then you use this BS variable to actually say you want to actually do some computation on it. Um, so this is an, um, a semantic that we have created as, uh, like especially for smart contract because a smart contract must be able to re receive funds. But we want to be able to know exactly that this contract is designed to receive funds. So if you don't have this, anyone can actually push money to your contract. So this is actually not a very good practice, So which is why we have this uh, semantics right here at the bottom. And uh, this is actually how a, uh, a smart contract can actually interact with other smart contracts as well. So this is the, what we call a messages. They can actually send uh, like a message to another sender, like they can and and a certain data to actually invoke certain con conditions. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is like this the amount of funds that you want to transfer in a message. So, yep, then yep, I've explained this as well. So it's um, yeah, so this is the overall um, architecture of a smart contract. <laughs> I'm so sorry that I have to really rush this through because we only have 20 minutes. Um, yeah, but today we really want to just like uh, let you guys know um, other things that we are actually doing here at Zelika. 
we are a Singapore based company and we are currently hiring for more people. So we know that this session has been very short because uh, it's very hard for us to condense what we know over the past few years to you over 40 minutes. So if you are interested in blockchain or you're interested to do more, or if you're just looking for something cool to actually play with, you can actually consider Zelika. We are hiring. So positions at both Zelika and Achilles, we have the following positions available, which is pretty much, I think every, I think we've covered every ground. If you're a non-tech person, you can even join us as well. We, uh, if you're interested in any of these positions, you can talk to Jin Hao or I. We will, um, we'll, we'll be able to actually um, uh, explain to you more about what we do. And the thing is that interns are welcome. And um, yeah, the thing about interns is that we we don't we actually value the interns a lot. So we give them a project to do. Uh, we don't we don't send the interns to buy coffee. That's, that's not that's not what we do in Silica. But we give them very meaningful jobs. So like for example, like there's an intern called Ken. He's uh, he joined us in earlier this year. He has been instrumental in helping us to actually do performance tests on Silica. And um, so. And he ended up in the paper that together with Ayer Sergey, so it's a research paper that was that, that is like uh, recently accepted into Opsla conference in 2019. So yeah, you want to talk about the yeah. interns? So, so yeah. Opsla yeah. is actually an academic yep. conference in uh, PL mm. and Opsla is actually Program a language. conference. So this is like probably one of the few like uh, smart la smart contract language to get actually get accepted into a top tier uh, academic conference so yeah our intern is there actually is in one of the uh, co-authors the rest are Ilya which is uh, from Yo NUS and the team members so we also have other interns working on very very interesting projects and like Brian on the smart contract sharding and Edwy which is uh, the former president of uh, NUS Hacker recently uh, he went over to US uh, to study his masters at Stanford he actually worked on uh, a feature called what we call a Scylla IPC and his feature got uh, actually deployed to the mainnet just yesterday like 11 p.m. Yep. yeah we so we had a major release yesterday yeah we have our first major release since mainnet so yeah this is the one of the major he worked on one of the major pieces and of course there are other uh, not only at the you know the the uh, software engineering side we also have the research side or perspective so people are like you know we have um, like building a testing framework, trying to, you know, basically we have a lot of uh, research and uh, non researchy uh, projects available for interns. So if you are considering an internship with us, just, you know, should uh, drop us a mail or even drop our careers at Zilliqa a mail or, yeah, and we'll try to get, uh, get in contact with us and we'll try to find a project that fit your interests. Yeah. Well, you have to tell us what you want or we'll just get you to buy coffee. So. Ah, yes. <laughs> That's a very important trait, yeah. So, so yeah, so um, yeah, we have uh, come to the end of our presentation. So thank you for your time and your Friday, spending your Friday with us. If you have any questions, come and talk to us. We are always here. So, all right, thanks a lot for having thank you. Uh, so we'll be taking a five minute break. Nice. Sure, we met the time. Yeah. 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 yeah, we can do a Q&A if you... Yeah, yeah, oh. sure. But then, uh, yeah, yeah. so, I mean, if you want to go off, uh, you can just tell you can go off, but if you want to ask us any questions, you can ask us any questions. We are, we are, we are here.